Welcome in to episode 37 of The Checklist, brought to you by Secure Mac. I'm Ken Ray. I'm Nicholas Rapa. And I'm Nicholas Tachek. If you're like us, you live online. And you share information online. Passwords, credit card information, mother's maiden name, maybe. These are all keys that we use to get other information, which is fine. If we trust the site, everything's cool, right? Now, you know the answer. There are bad guys out there who want to trick you into giving them this sensitive information. Phishing, as this practice of impersonation is known, is not a new thing by any stretch of the imagination. And with so much money flowing online and so much personal data available, more and more people are going phishing. That's the focus of today's checklist. Phishing, with an emphasis on social media. Items on the list, the many forms of phishing, uh, the growing sophistication of phishing attacks, how to tell if you've been phished or hacked, uh, what to do when you discover a phishing attempt, and finally, ways to protect yourself against phishing. So let's start at the very beginning with the, uh, with the forms that phishing can take. Uh, originally, the easiest way to trick someone into volunteering sensitive information was simply to send them an email that looked perfectly legitimate but led to a fake website. This method is still widespread and common, but new phishing email scams appear all the time. They make various claims to grab your attention. For example, they may tell you that your bank account has been compromised and you must change your password. In other cases, it might be an attempt to extract personal information, such as your social security number. Email phishing attacks are sometimes targeted at very specific people or groups of people, and this form of attack is known as spear phishing. An attacker, in this type of case, knows kind of more information about their specific target. It's not targeting some random guy down, you know, across the country. It's, uh, they've done their research. Such attacks often carry an additional air of legitimacy as the perpetrator appears more official or to have a personal connection to the victim. A recently highlighted spear phishing attack involved an email that was allegedly sent from a CEO to his CFO requesting specific financial action to be taken. Uh, While you might not be a likely target of a spear phishing attack, it's a good reason to view all unknown emails with some amount of suspicion. Spam filters have improved to the point where many of the most common phishing emails are filtered out automatically. You never even see them but it's still worth remembering that this type of threat exists. You know, occasionally, uh, one of those emails might, might get through to your inbox, so simply avoid clicking strange or unfamiliar links in emails, especially if it's from an untrusted email address. If you're just not sure, don't be afraid to contact the person who the email claims to be coming from and ask if they sent it. Now, we've mentioned this before on the show, but uh, contact that person some other method than email. Call them, uh, text them, uh, go ask them in person. Uh, if you're just sending an email and reply saying, hey, Joe, did you actually send me this email? The, the fisher's just going to say, oh, yes, I'm Joe, and I sent that email. Uh, so, you know, not only uh, you're taking the time to reach out through a different communication method uh, will not only confirm the validity of the email, it's also just a good practice. And by doing that, you're sharing this type of best practice with other people, which increases the security of uh, your personal community. And now, in the social media age, email phishing is too basic for some of these digital thieves. Instead, they try to exploit the way social media users think uh, to gain access to personal information. One of the more prominent forms of this is through so-called profile viewing apps. I'm sure uh, a lot of listeners have seen those ads or posts shared by friends for an app that will tell you who's viewed your profile. Uh, you know, everybody wants to know how popular they are or, or if people are paying attention to them, and, and these apps kind of prey on that. Uh, and there are websites and software that make claims saying they can tell you who visits or views your profile, uh, and they've been appearing for for years, you know, since the early days of MySpace. Now, what happens if you go to use one of these apps? Well, 
usually the first thing is it'll ask you for your username and password saying it needs access to your account to get those stats. Whether it's Twitter, Facebook, or another social media site, the app will try and pretend that it's legitimate by emulating the look of the social media website. Now, after you enter your information, it goes straight to the, the server of the, uh, the individuals who are controlling the app, straight to the bad guys. Uh, software like this doesn't actually work. Twitter, Facebook, uh, Instagram, the, the people running those companies, those, those actual companies themselves, know who's viewing whose profile and all that other stuff, but they don't make that information public. Uh, that's that's their their information, and none of these these apps have the capability to actually work. Uh, some of them try and make it look like they're working by reading through your friend list and randomly displaying some users, make it look like, oh yeah, uh, Sue viewed my profile five times last week, or you know, Joe saw me last month. It's, it's just you know, smoke and mirrors there to kind of make you think uh, that you didn't just hand over all your details to to uh, scammers. Now, some apps might even try and sell you advanced services or more powerful tools to take control of your social media profile. After all, why settle for stealing just your credentials when they could fish some financial information? Now, not only do you risk uh, potential charges from in-app purchases, but the bad guys will now have access to your credit card number, perhaps even a billing address, uh, kind of depending on, on the route they're going there. Um, other times, there are posts that you'll come across on Facebook, for example, uh, with people commenting with just a link to a sensational or shocking video. You, know, you have to see this video. Uh, uh, click now. Uh, otherwise, uh, there, another form of the scam is people saying they got a, a really good discount on some popular service or you know, a good price on uh, at some store. And following these links usually just leads to fake login forms or attempts to extract payment information for products that don't even exist. Online surveys are another method, especially those that claim to give away gift cards as rewards. Uh, the, the other thing that can be concerning is a lot of times on Facebook, you'll see friends who are uh, kind of sharing these survey posts. You know, who would you pick to be uh, on a desert island with you? Uh, what's your dog's name? What high school did you go to? And it's all this personal information that's a lot of times used for security questions to do password uh, reset requests. And so just giving that information up, especially publicly, uh, is never a good idea. So uh, a good, good uh, plan to follow is just don't reply to those surveys. Try not to let people give away your information as much as possible. Uh, but uh, another final method uh, would be that fishers commonly rely on basic user error typos as ways to reach potential victims. When you're typing a web address in your browser, it's really easy to mistype the address by one or two characters. We've all done it at some point. In some cases, a malicious party could have previously registered that typo domain and set it up to look like a real site that you'd expect, hoping that you'll just log in without actually double checking the address bar. So be sure to check where you're landing on the web. It can be tough to spot those typos. Since the phishing practice of using domain name typos has become widespread, many major websites have taken the initiative and registered a bunch of variations and typos uh, of their own names. But there's no guarantee that you're going to land on an authentic domain. So be alert. So those are some of the common phishing methods that are out there today, and new efforts to obtain personal information constantly appear. As efforts to fight phishing improve, the bad guys turn to novel and sometimes extensive methods, game of cat and mouse, ongoing all the time. Yeah, what's interesting is a lot of the stuff that you were just talking about would really have to, I mean, yes, it's a phishing attack, but I kind of have to stumble into it in a way, or I have to really not be paying attention. Um, there are more sophisticated phishing attacks out there, though. The money people can make off your information inspires fishers to look for new ways to fool you. More and more frequently, phishing now also uses malvertising to serve up bogus links. The common web spoofing attacks we were just talking about has taken on new forms. Cloud services like Dropbox and Google Drive also have the potential problems of their own. To highlight the level of sophistication that could be used, 
Let's look at a vulnerability that might let a fisher exploit a flaw in the way browsers render non-English characters into ASCII text. ASCII is the most common way to show text on computers. It contains the English alphabet, numbers, punctuation, and some special symbols. However, we need a way to display foreign characters too. For that, we have Unicode, which contains many thousands of characters across many languages. To allow browsers to display Unicode characters in ASCII-based domain names, we have what is called Punicode, which uses ASCII characters to signal to a browser to display a URL that contains Unicode characters. So where does the phishing aspect come into this picture? Well, some foreign characters, such as letters in the Cyrillic alphabet, look remarkably similar to letters in the Roman alphabet. Theoretically, a phisher could create a link to a website using Punicode that renders in your browser as a URL you know and recognize, like apple.com. Instead of Apple, though, some characters, like the capital A, aren't actually what they appear. You could then land at a spoofed website where, as before, the fisher can attempt to steal your credentials. What about the issues with cloud services we mentioned? It's possible for a fisher to use these services to set up a page that mimics a legitimate login page. Both Dropbox and Google Drive have experienced this issue in recent years. Fishers construct a duplicate login page that sends information back to them. They then host it at a public file on a Dropbox or Drive account. They often send emails or perhaps messages on social media with a pretext to click the link to this fake page. Users who aren't very careful can be fooled because accessing the file through the site means it appears over an SSL connection. With the appearance of legitimacy, it's easy to trick unsuspecting users. So we've hit two different, well, two different levels of phishing, I would say at this point, sort of the one that I might stumble into, the one that's more targeted. Let's assume, sadly, that I've fallen for one of these. Um, well, no, let's not assume that I've fallen for one of them. How do I know whether I've fallen for one? How do I know if I've actually been fished or hacked? Well, the, the first thing is to be aware of what's out there. Familiarize yourself with the methods we just discussed. You can even keep an eye on the news because phishing scams that become really widespread often make headlines, especially in the security sector. Knowledge is power might be a tired cliche, but it's also true in this case. Avoiding phishing scams is sometimes as easy as spotting suspicious misspellings or recognizing that you've landed on an incorrect domain. Next, watch out for suspicious activity on your accounts. If you notice that your account is posting content you didn't approve of or create, or sending messages out to your contacts, or you know, one of your contacts messages you saying, hey, did you really send this email? Uh, it's a sure bet that your account's been compromised. In the worst cases, you could even be locked out of your account altogether. It's just a reminder why it's so important to use unique passwords, because even if somebody discovers one of them, it won't unlock any of your other vital accounts. Unfortunately, way too many people still reuse passwords with sensitive services uh, like their email and their bank accounts and use the same password for social media or you know, whatever other websites out there. Uh, financial issues can be tougher to detect, but it's always important to monitor your credit cards for unusual activity. There's another way you might find out as well. Uh, sites like Facebook and Google might just tell you. Many services today utilize methods for identifying unauthorized access to your account. They will then proceed to lock down the account and request that you verify your identity to, and change your password. Usually it comes in the form of a, an email alert or a text alert, depending on, uh, on which service. And it'll say, you know, this somebody logged into this account from this IP address, which is in this location on this date at this time, uh, was this really you? Uh, so, you know, if you see one of those and you weren't expecting it, um, 
yeah, could be a good sign that somebody has your password. Uh, if any point you realize that you've fallen victim to a phishing scam, especially right after the fact, it's definitely time to start acting because you have options and you can fight back to prevent or mitigate further damage. So then what would I do? Well, first things first, if you're browsing on a desktop or a laptop device, check your machine for malware. And you can use software like MacScan 3 to quickly find and, if necessary, eliminate any of the malicious software deployed on your machine. Phishing websites are often havens for malware and may attempt to use a variety of exploits to place a payload on your machine. While not always the case, it's worth the peace of mind to run a scan and be certain that your system contains no keyloggers or other malware that steals information. If you've provided your credentials for a social media site, change your password immediately. If you've used that password anywhere else, change it there as well. If you can, set up two-factor authentication as soon as possible. Hackers won't have access to your phone, so verifying your identity this way ensures fishers can't break back into your account. Two-factor authentication, it's an excellent security feature available across the web, and it protects users from more than just phishing. More and more sites are implementing it, so check to see if your favorite sites now support it. If you can't access your account at all, contact the support team of the website. Many major social networking sites and online retailers keep measures in place for supporting individuals who have been phished. Their teams can help you regain access to your account via their own internal methods and identity verification steps. What if you've handed over payment details, like your credit card number? It's time to call your bank or credit card company. Let them know what happened. These days, customer service agents are aware of phishing. Consider closing these accounts and opening new ones. Again, your bank could help you do that quickly and easily. The sooner you initiate these efforts, the less likely you are to suffer financial loss. In serious cases, you could even contact credit reporting agencies to request a fraud alert for your credit profile. This way, you'll receive instant notification if suspicious activity occurs with your financial details. So I feel like we probably hit some of these, or maybe they're sort of implied, but the last item on the list, what are some concrete steps I can take to protect against phishing attempts? Well, first... Beware of social media apps, offers, and posts which appear too good to be true. Anything that claims it can offer you a new feature and then asks for your password is likely something you should avoid. Along the same line with passwords, we've recommended them before, but password management apps can really be beneficial in avoiding phishing. A lot of them have uh, autofill capabilities where they'll you know, basically pre-fill the, the login and password information on the website you're visiting and they also have security measures in place to verify that it is the right domain name, not you know a puny code uh, uh, faking Apple.com. It's actually verifying it is Apple.com before it will fill your password. It's a really great way to avoid giving up your sensitive information to the bad guys. Uh, also, never download and run suspicious software, as that's one of the primary ways that malware authors and fishers can attack Mac users for their information. At the same time, scrutinize links and URLs, especially if you're not using a password manager. Uh, does the domain name look strange? Does it say something like .cc at the end instead of .com? Does it use a, a really long Google link to redirect you to another website? These are all signs that you might be dealing with a phishing site. Now, if you do end up on a page asking for your information, examine all aspects of the page. Phishing sites often have outdated graphics or logos, broken functionality, spelling and grammatical errors, and more. Spotting these types of problems can tip you off before you type anything into that site. Protecting yourself from attacks that use methods like Punicode is more difficult, but keeping your browser updated is a good first step. For Firefox users, you can install an extension that forces browsers to stop rendering Punicode in ASCII. So it makes it way easier to spot those fake URLs before clicking on them. I know I've said before that um, 
the website for this show is a good resource for people who need uh, security help. I think that's like doubly so or triply so for this particular topic. Um, I've mentioned before, I have this one family member who's constantly telling me, not constantly, but it feels constant, (laughs) constantly telling me that she's been hacked. And the, the problem is not that she's been hacked. The problem is that somebody has targeted her, gotten her to give them information. So, yes, she's been hacked, but not like somebody's broken into her computer, more like she's left the key under the mat or worse, uh, handed the key to that person. So if you know somebody who who uh, things like this have happened to in the past or uh, things like this continue to happen to, uh, please direct them to the notes for this show at securemac.com slash checklist. That website again is securemac.com slash checklist. And that's good for this show and all the past shows and, you know, all the shows to come. If you have a topic you'd like to hear us hit or a question you have for the guys, uh, we do have an email address. That is checklist at securemac.com. The address again is checklist at securemac.com. And if you can't remember that, please remember this. You're listening to The Checklist by Secure Mac. And we'll talk to you next week.